Hi, so today we're going to be talking about chapter 15, which is characteristics, applications, and processing of polymers. So the stress-strain curves, um, talking about the mechanical properties of polymers, the stress-strain curves for polymers can vary a lot. So you can have a uh, stress-strain curve that looks very similar to what you would see for a ceramic, and those are your brittle or glassy polymers. You can have a stress-strain curve that looks a little bit more similar to what you might see for a metal, and that's kind of your plastic polymers. And then you can have the stress-strain curve from materials called elastomers. When I think of elastomers, I think of rubber bands. Um, and they're very uh, unlike both ceramics and metals. You can see the stress-strain curve looks very, very different from what you would see for a metal or a ceramic material. For all polymers, the fracture strength is going to be a lot lower, about 10% or less of what you would see for a metal. But of course, they're going to be a lot more elastic. They're going to deform a lot more than a metal. You can have the elastics uh, or the ductility or elasticity of a polymer be a thousand percent or more of what you would see for a metal material. Now let's look at the uh, brittle fracture and the plastic failure. First of all, the, um, the definitions of some of these things are a little different for polymers versus what you would see for metals. So for uh, polymers, the yield strength is defined as the top of the hump here on a plastic type polymer. That's different from a metal, remember, where the yield strength is defined at, say, a, a point 0.002 strain or 0.2% deformation of the metal. So that's different definition for yield strength. And also the tensile strength is defined as where fracture occurs. And when they say strength in uh, polymers, they typically mean the tensile strength. Um, and the tensile strength can be greater or less than the yield strength for a polymer. Okay, so if you look at what's going on um, for cross-linked or for networked polymers, okay, these are ones that there's a lot of bonding amongst the chains of the polymer. And those are the ones that are typically your brittle polymers that have the failure and don't have that plastic or deformation region. And what's happening with them is that the bonds themselves are lengthening and the angles of the bonds are changing as the stress is applied until it can't give any more and then you get your brittle fracture, okay? For plastic failure, the, de the uh, mechanism is a little different. For semi-crystalline or plastic polymers, what you have, remember, for a semi-crystalline material is you have these regions where the polymer chains are aligned. And then in between the aligned polymer chain regions, you have these amorphous regions right here. So what happens in a plastic polymer is you have this sort of undeformed structure where your um, uh, crystalline regions might not be aligned with one another. And as you apply um, a stress to the polymer, the amorphous regions in between the crystalline regions start to elongate. Um, and that's happening here in sort of the elastic part of the curve. And then eventually, when you get to sort of the peak here, where the yield strength is, measure, is measured, then your crystalline regions begin to align. And that's where you start to see a substantial neck in your polymer. As you proceed through, you might even see a dip down in your stress strain curve. And then what happens there is your crystalline blocks, remember your chain kind of loops back on itself um, in those crystalline regions and forms little platelets. And what happens is in between where the curves meet, those crystalline regions might actually separate and slip away from one another. And then it starts to align into sort of this fibral structure that happens near failure until the um, pump polymer actually breaks. Um, what happens is in this alignment region, that actually causes strengthening of the polymer um, right there. It's similar to um, similar to uh, cold working in metals. It can cause a strengthening of the polymer there near failure. Um, so unlike in metals, the neck region in a polymer can substantially grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and that corresponds to the polymer in that region strengthening. 
This is often called pre-deformation by drawing. So drawing, for example, is when you take a polymer and you stretch it out into a fiber. So for example, if you're making monofilament fish line, this would be by drawing. So you stretch your polymer prior to use to align the change in the stretching direction. And what that can do for you is increase your elastic mod modulus in the stretching direction, increase your tensile strength in the st stretching direction, but also decrease your ductility. Remember those two things are flip, um, flip coin sides of, the, of each other. If you anneal it or heat it after you do that drawing, of course you're going to reverse a lot of those effects. And this is very similar to the idea of cold working in metals. Now, if you have an, elastom uh, an elastomer, then the stress strain curve looks very, very different. So for your brittle failure, remember you have your cross-link polymers or your network polymers. For plastic failure, you have your semi-crystalline polymers. Elastomers, however, are these amorphous chains that have a lot of curving around on themselves. Um, they could be kinked or cross-linked. Um, and then what happens is, as you apply a stress to the material, all those kinks and twirls start to unravel and untangle, and that causes the material to just stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch. And then right before for failure, you have your chains. They're much straighter. They might still be cross-linked, but they're very, very aligned. Okay? There's two different kinds of plastics. Um, they can be defined as either a thermoplastic or a thermoset. And that's because the polymers are often classified according to their behavior at high temperatures. So thermoplastics, they soften when they're heated and then eventually they liquefy. And this is a reversible process. And thermoplastics are relatively soft and they're easy to recycle. However, thermoset polymers are these network polymers with extensive cross-linking, like 10 to 50% cross-link, and they don't soften when they're heated. And heating to excessive temperatures will break those cross-links, but this basically destroys the polymer. And so you're really not, um, e they're not easy to recycle. So some examples of thermoplastics are polyethylene, polypropylene, polycarbonate, polystyrene. So that's your um, polyethylene might be a lot of your plastic bags. Bags, um, plastic bottles, polycarbonate is glassy, and then polystyrene would you be your packing peanuts. Your thermosets, vulcanized rubber from tires, epoxies, polyester resin, and phenolic resin. Um, so any kind of uh, basically setting glue that you might use that has a two component that you mix together, those are also thermosets. Now there's a huge difference, um, there's a huge temperature dependence to the polymer properties. Um, they heat up and what happens is if you decrease the temperature, you're going to increase the elastic, mo elastic modulus, increase your tensile strength, and decrease your ductility. Okay, so this is shown here in some plots for semi-crystalline polymethylmethacrylate or plexiglass. And you can see what the stress strain curves look like uh, at 4 degrees C, 20 degrees C, 40 degrees C, and 60 degrees C. So you can see that they get a lot more ductile, less brittle, but also less strong as they're heated. You can also see these same effects if you increase your same uh, strain rate. So if you apply a uh, force or stress faster on the material, then you can see some of the same effects. And that has um, a, that's because they heat up as they're deformed. Um, but if your strain rate is too high, then they don't have time to heat up much. And so they act as, um, as a colder polymer. Sometimes when you deal with polymers, you'll see two different temperatures given or listed in the um, safety data sheet. Uh, material, your melting and your glass transition temperature. So these are two different temperatures. And you might wonder what's going on there. Well, the melting temperature is defined as when a polymer goes from a solid to a liquid state. However, you're going to get sort of a, a spread in the data for that because the melting of the polymer takes place over a temperature range and is going to depend on the history and also the properties of the sample. So, for example, you might have a more heavily cross-linked polymer depending upon its history and that might change its melting temperature. Also, the molecular weight of a polymer can greatly affect, and if there's some sort of spread in the molecular weight, then you're going to get a melting transition temperature that might um, change or might be a little different from sample to sample. If your temperature is greater than your melting temperature, you basically got a viscous fluid. 
There's also defined, however, the glass transition temperature for polymers. And that's when a polymer goes from a rubbery state to a glassy state. So when a polymer is in between its glass transition temperature and its melting temperature, it's a rubbery solid. But if it's greater than the glass trend or less than the glass transition temperature, then it's a glassy solid. Now, if you have a highly crystalline polymer, then um, there's not a very large range temperature difference between the glassy and the, uh, the glass transition temperature and the melting temperature, so they come together. So what factors can affect the melting temperature and the glass transition temperature? Well, both of these things increase with increasing chain stiffness. And the chain stiffness can be increased if you have bulky side groups, if you have polar groups or side groups, or if you have double bonds and aromatic groups. Um, and the regularity of the repeat unit arra arrangements affects only the melting transition temperature. And so you can see that for a crystalline solid, you can see that there's um, these different behavior with temperature. You have sort of a straight line behavior for the density or specific volume for crystalline solids. For a semi-crystalline solid, you can see kind of two different slopes there. And for a glassy polymer, you can see uh, a more dramatic change in the slope. You might also hear the term viscoelastic applied to polymers. When a polymer is a rubbery solid, um, it's, a vis it's called viscoelastic. And the viscoelastic behavior can depend upon time and the temperature. And this kind of makes me think of drag and fluids. The time dependence kind of makes me think of a drag. And that's there's, uh, typified by there's often a lag in the response time of viscoelastic polymers to an applied stress. So you pull on it, and then it kind of slowly deforms. It doesn't deform right away, but slowly deforms. Forms, there's a lag, sort of a phase shift, if you will. And this can be quantified with these stress relaxation um, tests. So since there's that lag in the response time to an applied stress, to measure this property, you apply the stress relaxation test. And here, what you do is you have a strain in the tension, um, and you, you pull it to a certain strain and then you hold it. And then what you do is you measure the applied stress that is required to maintain this strain and you can watch that applied stress decrease with time. So you can put it in a machine, you can give it a pull, and then you can try and maintain that same displacement while measuring the force that's required to maintain that displacement, if that makes sense. And you can watch that stress fall off with time. And this can be quantified via a relaxation modulus. Um, uh, shown here in this equation, sigma of t over that strain that you're applying, that set strain. And you can see that there's a large decrease in the relaxation modulus when the temperature is greater than that glass transition temperature, which makes sense. Um, and here's a plot that shows how the relaxation modulus changes with respect to temperature, um, here ranging from 60 to 180 degrees Celsius for this amorphous polystyrene material. And you can see that for temperatures less than the glass um, transition temperature, you've got basically a rigid solid <clears throat> that only has that small relaxation time. And then there's a transition region, and then it starts to act like a more viscous fluid with a large relaxation time. So here's some representative glass transition temperature values in Celsius for various polymers. For a low density polyethylene and high density polyethylene, you have uh, low temperatures, minus 110, minus 90 degrees Celsius. Um, per for PVC, it's a higher temperature, 87 degrees Celsius, polystyrene, 100 degrees Celsius, and polycarbonate, 150 degrees Celsius. So there's a large temperature range there. <clears throat> For thermoplastic polymers, you often see a phenomenon that's called crazing during fracture. And what that is, is uh, you can get a craze forming in the polymer prior to cracking. Um, so what's going on with this is just like in metals, um, defects, cracks, or short corners in your material are often points of initiation for your failure. So crazing is a phenomenon that precedes uh, fracture in thermoplastic polymers, and it's localized plastic deformation, which leads to these small um, and interconnected microvoids that are shown here in the regions. Um, and then these little bridges, these little fibrillar bridges form between the microvoids, um, and that is because the chains are becoming aligned in that region. Um, and then that uh, propagates through as the crack when failure 
uh, is completed. We talked a little bit, um, shifting gears, we already talked a little bit about polymer formation in an earlier chapter, but just to reiterate on that, there's two types of polymerization. There's the addition or chain polymerization, and then there's a condensation or a step polymerization. So um, when you're synthesizing uh, these large molecules, your monomers, they usually come from coal, oil, natural gas, and petroleum products. Um, and in addition to polymerization, what you do is you take a monomer unit and attach it one by one. And there's three steps to that. Of course, initiation is when you introduce that free radical. And the free radical um, uh, breaks some of the intercarbon bonds in your monomer unit and then attaches. Um, and when that breaks, this carbon over here has a, has a uh, free dangling bond. And then that continues the reaction um, into the propagation step. Um, the chain growth is rapid. Um, it only takes about 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 3 seconds to form a 1,000 repeat unit chain. And then um, when you want to stop the reaction, you can terminate it one of two ways. You can either um, introduce a group that will bond with the free radical on one end and stop it that way, or you can get the chains to hook together to each other and kind of combine to form one big um, uh, polymer unit. There's another type of polymerization where you're hooking together two dissimilar materials, um, kind of A, B, A, B, A, B, um, like that. Um, this is similar to what we're going to do in a lab to make nylon 6. Um, and there you have these two materials, you break the bonds there, and you hook them to one another. And then the reaction can just continue. So uh, you have this hexamethylene diamine that hooks up to this adipic acid here, and then on the other side you can get another hexamethylene diamine diamine and hook it up there and so on and so forth um, and the reaction proceeds in that way. But anyway it's a chemical reaction between two different species. Lots of times in uh, factories they'll want to add additives, polymer additives, and the additives can improve the mechanical properties, processability, durability of the polymers among other properties. So there's a couple of main ones. Pardon me. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so the additors, additives, they um, form these composite materials for fillers. So um, fillers are added to improve the tensile strength and the abrasion resistance, toughness, and to decrease cost. So for example, you might add carbon black, silica gel, wood flour, uh, glass, limestone, talc, or a lot of other things um, to improve those properties. And when you do that, you're basically forming a composite material. On the other hand, plasticizers are generally liquids with low molecular weights, and they're often um, added to reduce the glass transition temperature below room temperature, or transform a brittle material into a more ductile material. And this is commonly added to PVC, otherwise it's really brittle and it fractures very easy. You can also add stabilizers, um, and the stabilizers might protect it from degradation due to oxygen or ultraviolet radiation. Um, you can add lubricants to allow easier processing. Uh, if you have a high coefficient of friction, for example, in between your polymer and some of the rollers or the dyes that um, you might use in a processing plant, then you might want to add a lubricant to add um, easier sliding. An example of that is sodium ster stearate. Um, you might want to color your polymer, make it pretty for toys or whatever other application, and then you add dyes and pigments to it. And you might also want to add flame retardants. These are usually substances that contain chlorine, fluorine, and boron. And of course, um, you might want to do that to reduce the flammability of your material. Um, the processing of plastics. Uh, remember, your thermoplastics can be reversibly cooled and heated. They can be recycled. Um, and there you can also heat them until they're soft and then shape them as you desire and then cool them. And of course, these are the polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, polycarbonate materials. Your thermoset polymers, however, when they're heated, they form a network. It's a chemical reaction, kind of like mixing the two materials together in an epoxy. Um, and it degrades. It doesn't melt when it's heated. So what you have to do there is you have to have a pre-polymer that's molded it into a desired shape and then have that chemically react. And for example, there are urethanes or epoxies. 
I have some videos for you to watch um, that are from other sources. I've listed the links on our course webpage, and they're a lot of fun um, watching these things as they go through the factory and how it's actually done. But to just kind of briefly explain how, um, how polymers are processed, um, in processing plastics, you can do several different techniques. One is compression molding, and these are done for thermoplastics and thermosets. And in that, you take the polymer and its additives and you put it in a mold cavity. And then the mold's heated and it's brought together and pressure is applied. And then your polymer um, kind of assumes the shape of the mold. So that's compression molding. You can also do injection molding. This is done with thermoplastics and some thermosets. And so what you do there is you have a, uh, a ram that gets pulled back and then plastic pellets from your hopper drop into the barrel and then you push your ram in and that forces the plastic into a heating chamber around your spreader where the plastic melts as it moves forward and then that molten plastic is forced under pressure into a cavity and it assumes the shape of the mold. They do this with Legos. You can also use extrusion. This is done with thermoplastics and it's uh, similar. You have a hopper with plastic pellets that drop from the hopper into a turning screw and then the pellets melt as the turning screw pushes them forward um, and then the molten plastic is forced under pressure through a shaping die to form a final product. Um, and you use this if you want to do tubing, pipes, sheets, or structural parts. There's also blown film extrusion, which is really similar to regular old extrusion, except that when it comes out the die, there's an, a strong air current being forced through, and then that air um, causes a bubble to form, which pushes the polymer even further apart um, than it was before, and then um, kind of pushes the polymer upward through some guy rolls and then it's pinched off and rolled out. And this is done a lot of times with bags, films, and sheets. And uh, like I said, make sure to watch at the end of this lecture. There's some links underneath it to videos of how this is done in the plants and I encourage you to watch those. If you have any questions, let me know. I hope you enjoyed it.